second session in uh, our Growing Greener series of, of two, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed last week. Um, we had a number of interesting uh, presenters uh, there and, uh, and seeing some practical examples out in the field of uh, farmers uh, here in, uh, in, in Cornwall. So this is the second session. It's uh, obviously live, which is uh, a relief. And uh, we're looking for people to participate uh, as well uh, strongly this evening. I'll go through that in just a, a little bit. Um, first of all, if I introduce myself, I, my name is Robin Teverson and I chair the Cornwall and Dals of Scilly Local Nature Partnership. And uh, I'm here with uh, three other organisations really this evening, Cornwall Council, Cornwall Area of Na Outstanding Natural Beauty, who are uh, uh, key players here, and obviously also uh, Natural England. And what we're looking at really is this whole area of uh, the environmental land management scheme that's going to come and replace uh, the basic payment scheme and nature recovery, which are, are two key things that are going to change over the next uh, few years. Just to remind us, really, if you could keep uh, muted for me, that would be great. I do want you to participate, so uh, please share comments and questions in the sidebar. Uh, which uh, I'm sure all of you are, are used to how these systems work now. Please don't be shy, except to say that uh, the, the, this whole session is being recorded. So if uh, you don't want to appear on the recording, and uh, I suspect some will, some won't, then um, the way to do that is to turn your camera off. So what's going to happen this evening? Well, we have an hour, and uh, I, as I said, I do need your participation. We're going to start off with some short uh, uh, presentations by three of our guest speakers from Cornwall AOMB, uh, Natural England and uh, Cornwall Council to set the scene. So with no further ado, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Emma Browning, who is the manager of Cornwall Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. So Emma, I'm handing over to you. Hi Robin, thank you very much. Um, hello everyone, um, my name is Emma Browning, I'm the Cornwall Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty Partnership Manager. I'm going to talk to you for the next five minutes about environmental land management schemes and nature recovery. So the area, the Cornwall Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty, which we shorten to AOMB, is Cornwall's nationally protected landscape with the same status and protection as a national park. And you'll see the map in front of you has got 12 distinct sections in green. And these 12 distinct and diverse sections are all fall under the one designation of Cornwall AOMB, making it really unique and totaling a third of Cornwall's land cover. The land cover of Cornwall is made up of coastal, marine, freshwater, marsh, grassland and heathland habitats, and 75% of the land is farmed. The Cornwall AOMB unit, so the team, work to conserve and enhance with our partners the special qualities of this protected landscape so, it, so that it remains Cornwall's key environmental and economic asset valued by local people and visitors. So the AOMB is a partnership and you'll see all our partners logos on the screen just now. And currently we have 22 partners which cross cuts all sectors of industry in Cornwall and gives us a really great platform for collaboration. Sustainability is at the heart of what we do and collectively we cover social, economic and environmental objectives. From a farming perspective, FWAG Southwest, so the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, the NFU, the National Farmers Union and the CLA, Country Land and Business Association are key organisations that we work with to ensure that the AOMB is advised from an expert industry stakeholders. But in addition to that, um, we work directly with farming partners and we do that by um, working with them on projects and most recently on the lizard in a farming for the nation test and trial. We're, result we're always keen to work with farmers in the future, so please do get in touch with us. So what you'll see on the screen just now are screenshots of the AOMB management plan and plus there's a little bit of detail on there as to why we actually have a management plan. It sets the agenda for the management of protected landscapes. The current AOMB management plan is currently under review. Although our primary purpose is to conserve and enhance the AOMB landscape, nature recovery 
and environmental land management must be at the forefront and will be at the forefront of our policies, objectives and actions. And we want this management plan to be useful and an informative resource for everyone to use, benefiting farm businesses, landowners and land managers. DEFRA see us as playing a significant role in nature recovery and that the AOMB management plan should be shaped and help shape nature recovery planning in the county. These two plans will talk to one another, meaning that for farmers engaging in schemes, the messages are aligned and clear. So the AOMB are leading on an environmental land management scheme test and trial alongside FWAG, Southwest, the University of Exeter and Game Consulting with a group of farmers on the Lizard Peninsula and this is due to finish in June. The trial looked at valuing ecosystem services that the farms were currently providing, creating a natural capital prospectus showcasing what they may go on to provide with the right funding and the right investment. The results will be published soon and we're really happy to share those with you, uh, so please keep an eye out on our website. So just finally to say, Cornwall AOMB is committed to nature recovery. It is key that we unite together with landowners, farmers, businesses and communities as a collaborative network to deliver what is essential to reverse the decline in biodiversity and promote a green recovery. Our ability to adapt and respond to the climate and ecological emergency will be critical and now is the time to act and significantly increase the scale and pace of nature conservation. The Nature Recovery Plan will map and guide our priorities to ultimately make a difference in our parishes and county. We are all interlinked with nature in various ways via either the direct work in our landscapes right through to the food that we eat. We all play a part, we all need to play a part in the solution and collectively this is achievable. And thank you for listening to me and I'm going to hand you back now to Robin. Robin, over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Emma. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty impressive number of partners that you've, you've got there. That's, that's, that's really good to see. And you're absolutely right. And I didn't do it at the beginning, was to stress that we really do have a, a big nature challenge in Cornwall as we do in the rest of the country, in fact, globally as well. And it's really, really key to farm sustainability and into the future. And uh, what a dispersed AOMB as well. I mean, I don't know how you managed to get round with that. And of course, in Cornwall, we have half of the tamer AOMB as well. And there's one on the Ars of Silly. So, uh, no, that's that's a really excellent start. Thank you. I'm going to now introduce Becky Aston from uh, uh, Natural England. And uh, Becky, you're the Elm convener. Um, now, when I come across conveners normally, it's in Scotland and they're the most important people they are because they tell everybody what to do. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I hand over to you in and your power base, but uh, uh, Becky, uh, welcome anyway, and over to you. Thank you, Robin. Hopefully, my talk will explain what I do. Um, <coughs> as Robin said, I'm Becky Aston, the Natural England Environmental Land Management con Local Convener for Cornwall, and I'm currently working on a pilot developing the local nature recovery component of the environmental land scheme, and it's join up with the local nature recovery strategies. Um, throughout this presentation, I'll refer to the Environmental Land, Sch Land Management Scheme as ELM, otherwise it becomes a bit of a mouthful. Um, this is a short term project. I started in mid-January and the pilot is due to end by the end of March. Next slide, please. I'll give a quick over overview of the development of ELM, which is the cornerstone of our new agricultural policy and is founded on the principle of public money for public goods. This slide you're seeing now shows the six public goods that ELM will provide. ELM is intended to provide a powerful vehicle for achieving the goals of the 25 year environment plan and the commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, whilst also supporting the rural economy. With 70% of land in England being agricultural land, farmers are absolutely critical to tackling the joint biodiversity and climate crises. Many farmers are already taking action and we want to support the sector to do more to deliver environmental public goods alongside other land managers. As such, farmers are stewards of the environment we all rely on, from managing landscapes from which we derive clean water to protecting us from natural hazards such as flooding. Next slide, please. This slide gives an example of what public goods can look like within a farm landscape. 
And it's important to note that public goods benefit more than just the recipient and cannot be rewarded by the market alone. Next slide, please. So let's look at the components of ELM. There's three components. The Sustainable Farming Initiative, component one, is for all land managers and is focused on encouraging environmentally sustainable farming and forestry. Whether that's through nutrient management, using cover crops or planting wildflower margins, payments will be for practices that can generate valuable outcomes, most effective when delivered at scale, for example, countrywide. Component two, the local nature recovery component, is for the delivery of locally targeted outcomes. Targeting and prioritisation are essential, as many of the outcomes this will deliver rely on collaboration between land managers. As such, this component would also include a variety of mechanisms for encouraging and rewarding collaboration and join up between farmers, foresters and other land managers. Payments under this component will be for coordinated delivery of, for example, habitat creation, restoration and management, natural flood management, access management, recreational and educational infrastructure, geodiversity and the historic environment. Landscape recovery, component three, is focused on delivering landscape scale land use change projects, where such projects drive added value over and above what can be delivered through components one and two. It will coordinate projects that are critical in helping us meet ambitious environmental commitments, such as net zero carbon, and could include things like woodland or coastal habitat creation and restoration and peatland restoration. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed timeline for the scheme, with the national ELM pilot beginning to roll out shortly and with full rollout in 2024. The ELM national pilot is the means by which DEFRA will pilot ELM at scale in real world situations with a wide range of land managers. The aim here is to learn and innovate prior to the full rollout of ELM and build confidence in delivery and amongst stakeholders. The national pilot will have a modular structure and involve a mix of smaller pilots and deep dive studies to help test different kinds of approaches. Together, they will test three main things. How best to construct different types of agreements at different scales. How to target incentives to deliver specific environmental outcomes in specific areas. And the underlying scheme mechanics, for example, the applications and payments approach and the use of advisors. The pilot will also test many approaches at different scales. For example, local level agreements, larger agreements involving many land managers, and a wider ELM scheme open to all land managers. The national pilot will be undertaken in close consultation with stakeholders and land managers. It's still at a very early stage of development, but more details will be released over the coming months. So please do keep an eye out on the DEFRA website for that. So this is more about what I actually do. Uh, my aim as a local convener is to help bring the local nature recovery strategy and ELM together. The local nature recovery component of ELM will pay land managers for delivering on local environmental priorities. So in order to determine these priorities, we need the help of stakeholders, including farmers and other land managers. My role as a local convener is to test how we get stakeholder input through alignment with the local nature recovery strategies. ELM local conveners are working closely with the local nature recovery strategy pilots to make sure that we drive involvement of farmers and other land managers in the process of creating local nature recovery strategies. As such, DEFRA are very much committed to co-design with land managers. Ultimately, the involvement of farmers and land managers at early stages will mean they have a say in what priorities they could be paid to deliver under ELM. So I have four main objectives. To build on the local nature recovery strategy outputs, ensuring that they are understandable and practical for farmers and land managers and provide commentary on how these work from an ELM perspective. To explore how farmers, farm clusters and existing ELM tests and trials can be involved in shaping local nature recovery strategies and ensure that the knowledge is captured 
with the interest covered and that the process is understood and feels relevant in the local area. To identify whether there are any gaps in the local nature recovery process that need to be filled to make it work for ELM and how also we might bridge these gaps. And finally, to help farmers and land managers to understand the proposed local nature recovery strategy process and the implications and opportunities for them through spatial planning for nature. The key really is to test how the local nature recovery component of ELM can function effectively in aligning local farm priorities with ecosystem services opportunities. Thank you. I'll now hand back to Robin. Thanks, Robin. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Becky. And uh, can I say, and I say this quite genuinely, that's one of the most straightforward uh, um, explanations of uh, ELMS, as I refer to it. I think DEFRA are trying to call, get us to call it ELM these days, but uh, it sounds like a rock band that I used to know in the... Uh, I won't say when. <laughs> but, um, uh, so one of the best, yeah, no, very straightforward. And, I, and I'm delighted that we have uh, you here to uh, to help us through that over over the over the coming months. Um, I also uh, think one of the things that's always concerned me is that we have a, we're going to have a nature recovery network strategy, which uh, we're just about to hear about and with ELMS. And if the two weren't coordinated, uh, which they should be, uh, but so easy not to, then that would be a real waste. And uh, so it's great that you're there to actually pull those uh, pull those together. OK, we're gonna, now going to move on to our third presentation, which is uh, uh, from uh, Cornwall Council, Philippa. Uh, Philippa Hoskin, who's the Partnership and Policy Manager. But most importantly, forget the job title, what she is is Supremo for the Nature Recovery Network Strategy. And uh, Pip, you have to get this out. Well, it was going to be originally March, but uh, DEFRA have said because of all the COVID issues and everything else, it's looking like something like May now, which is still a, a really tough ask. Um, but we've made good progress. So I'm going to uh, uh, let you tell us where we are and how we're doing. Okay, over to you. Thanks ever so much, Robin. Hopefully, um, Melody's going to be able to put the slides up um, there for us now. Thanks. Um, evening, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Philippa Hoskin and I work in the Environment Service in Cornwall Council and I'm leading for Cornwall on the production of the Local Nature Recovery Strategy and we're in the pilot stage at the moment. So as Becky's just explained, there's, you know, a lot of uncertainty still around ELM, but what is certain is that, you know, a significant component of the ELM funding is going to be guided by these new Local Nature Recovery Strategies. And for me, I think I see this as a really welcome opportunity for Cornwall to steer some of the how and the where um, some of this funding is spent rather than it being top down, which is sometimes what we've seen in the past with agri-environment funding. And the local nature recovery strategy part of ELM funding will guide where um, actions needed for nature recovery, but also, also to maximise those public goods, things like carbon drawdown, natural flood management um, and the like. Uh, next slide, please. And I should just say that obviously the farming and landowning community are absolutely central to help shape this local nature recovery strategy. I'm not least of which because you're, um, you know, you're the stewards and owners of nearly 75% of Cornwall's land area. Um, so, you know, today, tonight is the start of you really helping to shape that local nature recovery strategy and guide how that funding spent. So why are we all talking about nature quite so much at the moment? Um, basically, you know, we are sadly in the midst of a climate and an ecological crisis and we are seeing that all the national indicators for nature are going in the wrong direction. There's been some steep declines and all of the global biodiversity targets, none of those were met last year. And, you know, I feel really blessed. I was really lucky to grow up here in Cornwall. You know, it's a green and beautiful county, but we wanted to know were these um, sad sort of trends being mirrored here in Cornwall. So we commissioned a state of nature piece of work by the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, which they're due to release in the coming months. But just recently they released some of the interim results, which you can see there on the slide in front of you. And it's sad to say that certainly within my lifetime, um, we are seeing those trends mirrored here in Cornwall for many of our sort of iconic and species and um, areas. So nature is in decline and we do need to do something about it. You know, and I think we all need to sort of try and be part of that, including um, the sort of farming community. Next slide, please. 
I think what we are lucky to be able to say that in recent years here in Cornwall, um, it's, the area has become a real kind of national leader in action for climate and for nature. Um, and one of the few sort of more non-metropolitan areas, more rural areas that is taking so much action. And there's a real kind of one and all approach here locally between the farming, the environment and the economic sector, all trying to work really hard to do the right thing for farming and for nature um, in, in, our, in our lovely county. And the Nature Recovery Plan sort of um, is coalescing some of that action. And I should say that um, the noises and the the sort of uh, the effective leadership going on here on these issues has been heard by government and we were approached back back in the summer and asked to be one of five national pilots for the production of these new local nature recovery strategies and that gives you and us a chance to sort of shape government policy before this becomes a statutory requirement when the environment act is passed which is likely to be autumn of this year um, so just to be clear that the, the Cornwall Local Nature Recovery Strategy covers the whole of Cornwall down to the intertidal area and we're looking at nature recovery opportunities in the marine habitats as well um, and it includes the areas of outstanding natural beauty both the Cornwall one and the Tamar Valley. Cornwall Council's leading on the production of the plan. We're what's called the relevant authority within the legislation, but it's being co-created with our local nature partnership of which Robin's the chair there and with the AONBs as well. Um, but we're still at the start of the process. And yeah, if we can go on to the next slide, please. I just want to sort of clarify, you know, because everyone talks about these plans and strategies, they, you know, sometimes they feel like they're coming out of our ears, but what's this one going to actually mean and, and what's it going to encompass? There's two main parts to it. The first of which is where we're at at the moment, which is trying to set out what are our priorities for nature here in Cornwall? Which species, habitats and places do we want to really focus on over the next few years? That then leads to a nature recovery network map. And we've already got a draft of that, a sort of first version of that on the Lagas hub, which was developed by the University of Exeter. And um, hopefully someone can put that in the chat box for you if you want to go and take a look at that. And that displays a lot of um, information for Cornwall and it sets out the existing nature areas, the designated areas, but also the best of the rest, you know, because some of our fantastic areas for nature aren't within the designated sort of network. But it will also set out where the opportunity areas are. And I think the key thing to, to note from that is we recognise that there are opportunities to recover nature and protect nature everywhere um, in Cornwall, you know, right in the hearts of our towns, within our um, agricultural areas. Um, but the sort of heat map that you can see there is one version of the information that might be um, set out in the Nature Recovery Network map. And we know that some areas may deliver more for nature and more of those public goods than others, partly because they might be sort of close to existing um, areas for nature, etc. But, you know, there is opportunity everywhere, basically, I think is the, one of the messages from that. So two parts of the plan, the nature recovery priorities and that network map, which will guide the ELM funding. Next slide, please. And hopefully, yep, anyway, I'll, sorry, next slide, please, if that's all right, Melody. Thank you ever so much, sorry, it's a little. And so, obviously, there's a lot of, um, pressures on our environment and one of the things that is very clear when we ask members of the public what what are they concerned about development comes up again and again um, development pressures on nature and one of the other functions of the local nature recovery strategy will be to guide our local planning framework it's already being used in the biodiversity net gain system which went live here in cornwall last March um, for major developments and importantly it's going to enable us to have these spatial allocations for nature within our planning system so some of you will be used to hearing about spatial allocations for housing and possibly renewables this will be the first time that we'll have a genuine allocation for nature based on the map that you saw or versions of the map that you saw um, in the last slide 
It's also going to guide other funding as well as the ELM funding. But really importantly tonight, we're focusing on where local nature recovery interacts with the ELM funding. Um, and I think the take home message from tonight needs to be, you know, that farming is changing. And, you know, as we've transitioned and have left the EU, the funding for farms is changing and that these new local nature recovery strategies are really going to steer a significant chunk of that money coming forward. But what we really want to do with you tonight is to get your voice within that, because we want to bring together stakeholder views and best available evidence to produce this local nature recovery strategy so that the funding is well used long into the future and we have thriving farms and thriving nature. So I'm now going to hand back to Robin and we'll get into the more interactive sessions. Um, so and we look forward to hearing your views. Thank you. You're on mute, Robin. I am indeed. I didn't want to interrupt your flow there, uh, Philippa. So thanks very much. And thanks very much to Emma, Becky and uh, Pip for, for those uh, introductions, which uh, were, were really good for where we're going. OK, as uh, as Philippa has said, we're now going to move into one of the more interactive uh, areas. And can I just remind people that we are going to have a Q&A session after this, so keep on putting your questions in the uh, in the chat bar and we'll come back to those. But uh, what we're going to do now is to uh, go through a process which hopefully you can help shape how ELMS is uh, applied here in Cornwall. And uh, I'm going to ask, we're going to ask some questions, four in all. I'm going to start with, uh, hopefully they're fairly straightforward, um, but uh, the way you do this is to look in the um in in the you'll see in the um chat bar there uh, under carl's uh, got question one there and you've got a, a menti link so you need to uh, have that uh, call up that link and then you can uh, put your answers in so the first question is how would you rank the elm public goods so um Let's uh, and you can go. I, let me say you can go through the questions at your own pace, and we'll look at your answers as we go through. So I'm going to have some commentary uh, from some some uh, key people as we go through. So get on to that link um, and start going through uh, the questions. As I said, question one: How would you rank the ELM public uh, goods that we saw earlier on? And uh, if you could uh, carry on with that uh, now. And uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to introduce uh, Sophia Hosking, who's the Strategic Director of, for Neighbourhoods at Cornwall Council. Uh, she has responsibility overall for the environment. Uh, she's a board member of uh, the Local Nature Partnership. And far more importantly than any of that, she is a farmer and uh, I think has uh, been out lambing uh, recently, although I think probably you're not dressed just for that at the moment, Sophie. So I hope I hope you haven't got to rush out. Uh, but uh, perhaps you'd like to give us a, a little bit of thought as we as we go through this process. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Robin. Yes. So um, so I I am I'm married to a farmer, um, Jeremy Hosking. His um, he and his brother James farm in partnership here at Fenton Gollan, and um, it's a, it's a quite mixed enterprises. We're tenant farmers, uh, so we don't own any of the land we farm. But we're on about, it's over 2,000 acres, um, some arable, um, we farm daffodils and sheep. And also uh, probably the main bit of the business is on the smallest part of the farm. It's probably on about 1% of the land and that's raising module seedlings. So seedling vegetable plants that then get grown on um, a lot by the farmers down west, but also all over the country. Uh, we grow about 130 million seedling cauliflowers, cabbages, leeks and other vegetables a year. Um, so so that, that's quite a, a big enterprise. I think um, thinking about elms and going forward, um, there are some concerns for us. I mean, the, the first concern is clearly that the um, by 2024, we're only going to be you know receiving about 50 percent of the, the basic payment that we currently receive. So that's that tends to concentrate the mind. But I, I think it's probably fair to say that we haven't really engaged with with elms yet, um, and part of that non-engagement is is around the difficulty in 
um, in the fact that there aren't really any concrete proposals um, as such coming out to, to kind of hang on to. So it's really difficult to translate what the themes are into, into practical actions. Uh, so consequently, I think I think many farmers are probably in the same position as us, and us, and are slightly in denial about about preparing for this. Uh, so so things like this today are really really important, and thank you so much for putting this on. Thanks, Sophie. Can I um, which, just which on this? Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. I was just going to say a tiny bit about the proposed about the about the priority order, if that was. Yeah. Yeah. Or would you like? Are you, are you on a? I didn't realize how long I had to say. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Can I can I talk about carbon capture later? Because that's really important. <laughs> okay. So let let let's see what we've uh, got there. Now we've got a we've got a clear clear winner: mitigation and adaptation to climate change. I mean, climate change has the big uh, headlines. Thriving plants and wildlife second. That's good to see. So we've got the mix between the biodiversity and the climate, and then clean water. Absolutely beautiful heritage. Good to, I'm sure the MB is pleased to see that. And environmental handles, clean air. Yes, well, maybe we don't have the, quite the problem that uh, the urban, uh, more urban areas have on, on clean air. We're very, we're very, very blessed that way. OK, let's uh, move on to, I'm like, we going to talk about the next two questions uh, then, which uh, um, let's have a look. So what would you prioritise for nature locally in question three? What actions would you take to support nature on your farm? So let us uh, let us know that. And uh, while we do that, I'm going to introduce uh, Oliver Baines, who's also a uh, very valued member of the Local Nature Partnership Board, also uh, a farmer and uh, very much an activist on these uh, areas of uh, of uh, um, in terms of nature and also climate change. So, Oliver, what do you reckon on these? Well, yes, uh, thank you, Robin. And the first thing to say is like small fry compared to um, Sophie. Um, we've got about 250 acres organic uh, in just south of the clay district, uh, where mixed sheep and beef right bang in the middle of lambing at the moment. So uh, this is great because it gets me off cleaning out pens. Um, uh, I'm a great advocate for organic and it's and I'd just like to say a little bit about the reasons why I mean the first thing which is really obvious is that it hits all all six of the ELM priorities or the list um I think the second thing is that it has an additional element which is about really uh, robust levels of animal welfare so um that means it's kind of hitting the health and well-being agenda as well as the as the DEFRA agenda. Um, I also think because we're in, you know, this is an emergency and being an emergency, we want to use what we've got and we've got systems and procedures which are already in place. We've got we've got a certification process. Um, we've got a really strong brand for organic and a market that's increasing dramatically at the moment. So everything is in its favour. And I think finally, I'd say it it does hit both the climate and the ecological emergencies. And uh, it's like the, the Sophie just raised the issue about carbon capture. I mean, this is a major part of what organic can offer because we're not using synthetic fertilizers and we're not using pesticides, which are responsible for much of the degradation of soil that we've seen uh, over the last 50 years. And because we've got healthy soil with a lot of organic matter, lot of soil carbon we can make a really really big contribution so uh that's why i advocate for organic and that's why i want it to be seen as one of the priorities and i might tie it into the idea of the whole farm approach i mean the great one of the great things about organic is it's not piecemeal it actually it's an in integrated approach for the whole farm so amongst many other things i think that ought to be one of our priorities Thanks, Oliver. Oliver, let me just follow a couple of those bits up. I mean, are, are there many organic farmers in, in Cornwall or are you there by yourself in, in, in the middle? No, 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 no. Well, <laughs> not nearly enough. Um, I actually can't give you an answer on that. It's somewhere I suspect between 30 and 40. Uh, we've got more in Cornwall. Probably Devon's got more than anywhere else. But, um, but we're only two to three percent, maybe uh, certainly under three percent of the whole market. The the, the 
food market in the in this country. So it's a tiny proportion of the whole. And I think what you know, one of our targets ought to be to increase organic up to 10 or 15 percent. I mean, in Europe, on the continent, they're up to 30 percent organic, some of some countries. So we're way, way behind everybody else. OK, and Oliver, just just one other thing, not just necessarily organic, but uh, I mean, I suppose many people uh, that uh, maybe aren't associated with farming at all, but but know hear of all the difficulties there are often would say, well, come on, is uh, is it possible actually to look after the environment and be financially viable at the same time? The two can't exist, can they? <laughs> well, of, of course it's possible because looking after the environment brings its own returns. And it's, you know, if you, if you cut your, um, you might be cutting some of your outputs, but you're also cutting your inputs, so your costs are lower. But also there are lots of opportunities for, for, for instance, bringing in schools, bringing in visits, creating. We were talking the other day about having, if you had a, uh, let's say we did something like glamping, we're not going to do it, but let's say we did something like glamping, you know, we could, we're part of the badger vaccination program. So, so we could have a hide up there overnight so people could go and watch the badgers. So you can use your, the environment you've got around you to the benefit of people around you. We've also got a fantastic, um range of birds and abundance of birds on the farm which i think would be really useful for environmental studies for for for, for schools and colleges so there are all sorts of opportunities there they're not they don't make up for the basic payment though unfortunately <laughs> so you know there is a big issue there yeah and that's why that's so important to get this uh, transition uh, right thank yeah. thanks oliver let's let's see if we perhaps i can ask carl if he could show up what sort of results we have here well what have we got coming through let's look at that habitat creation and protection target areas restoring waterways dredging wild birds as uh, oliver was talking about there rich species grassland soil carbon as everything follows from there that's true i mean the soil never got used to get talked about uh, in uh, in uh, westminster and whitehall and it is now regularly uh, i'm pleased to say uh, baseline of species being correctly assessed absolutely if we can't measure that and see what's happening then uh, that's a real we can't really act on it uh, at all carbon capture yeah all that uh, Carbon sequestration, soil trees, seagrass. That's interesting. There's marine uh, potential in terms of sequestration as well. Uh, I would like to ensure that parish and town councils are fully involved. Absolutely. That's. Uh, I think that's uh, happening more and more. Sustainable farming and food production, nature, then bits. It's whole farm approach. I think that's one of the big, big themes, as you can see, as uh, as. Uh, Becky said uh, that whole farm approach is uh, the very start of uh, Elms in, in the future. And there's one that often comes up really important in, in Cornwall as well as our hedgerows, not hedges as the rest of the nation knows them, but uh, far more substantial and far more rich uh, in, in, in nature as well. Great, some really good comments. Thank you everybody for, for that. Do we have graphs on, on these, uh, Carl, or are we uh, moving on from that? Oh, that's it for these, Robin. So good, some very good, interesting things there. Wildlife corridors, that's of course what Nature Recovery Network uh, is all about. Okay, excellent. We're going to uh, now move on to our fourth question. And uh, that is around uh, advice or assistance needs. And this is one of the areas I think is uh, really, really important. And one of the things the Nature Recovery Network is particularly uh, concentrating on as well, which is if we're expecting this huge change to take place, then we have to help people to make that transition. Otherwise, uh, what concerns me is that people will go out of farming, that uh, the next generation won't uh, continue, that, uh, that people will find it too difficult. They'll be too concerned about the financial implications of all this and financial planning. And farming is a, a complicated enough business as it is at the minute. So what kind of advice or assistance are you uh, interested in? And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, John Perry while we go through this. Uh, and John is uh, the uh, NFU 
County Chairman. We're really pleased to have you with us, John, Who and you farm just outside Launceston, I think. So perhaps you could tell us uh, from your point of view, what, what sort of things would you prioritise in here or any general comments indeed? And it, it's great to have you on, on, on the session. Yeah, hi there. Can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah, good evening all. And uh, actually, I've just, I've done my two years as chairmanship, Robin, so um, I passed on to Rob Halliday, who's a bit younger and a bit more vigorous and is going to be a very good uh, addition to NFU calls. So, uh, but I am part of the council and uh, still fairly involved in the committee. So thank you for asking me. Um, yeah, the last, I did speak at the last meeting we had at this type of meeting. And I felt that actually people didn't realise how important farming was to the um, to the recovery of nature, so to speak, and to the farm, and to the well, I think we're what ninety percent of land use is farming in this county. So we are so important to be a massive part of the equation of of getting getting this forward. Now, I think the biggest problem at the moment with engaging with farmers is is the fact that the government seems to be very very slow. They've been talking about all this all elms and sustainable initiative and everything, but there's no meat on the bones whatsoever at the moment. And I, I think that's a real issue, and the government are just trying to catch up, but very slowly. Um, I think what you guys are doing are great. Um, we need more discussion, and it needs to go out to more farmers. And I'm certainly on my farm. I'm looking. I'm in the stewardship schemes anyway, but I'm looking to change and do some wildflower strips. Um, we, we're lucky enough to be on the Tamer, so we're, you know we look after the river as well as we can. But also, we actually still what everything said on the chat box we still make our money from commercial farming. Now, I've been, you know, I'm doing minimal soil cultivations. I'm having, having my soil organic matter tested, which, uh, and all that sort of stuff with Becky Hughes from, um, from uh, the, the uh, college here. And um, we're all learning a hell of a lot. We're trying to get baselines to where we can start. But there's a lot of work to be done before we can pull in the whole farming community. I think there's a lot more interest and, the next big thing is also is land management. There's lots of different agreements. There's rent, there's, there's ownership, there's people, 50% of the land is rented. Are the landowners, are they going to take over the land and put it all to, all to uh, environmental and, and basically supersede the farmer, the tenant farmer? Obviously, I wouldn't want to see that whatsoever. So there's a lot of balancing to do. We've all got to work together. I know some good initiatives going on working, landlords and tenants working together, but and there's a lot of good work being done, but also there's other work which is showing no signs of movement either way at all. So there's a lot of work to be done there. The government got to be aware of it. And um, but this is a great start, and I'll certainly be involved in the future. So thank you, Robin. Thanks uh, very much, John. And, and I guess this is one thing we aren't going to be able to fix on this uh, uh, particular um, uh, webinar or session is the is the changing uh, suddenly getting clarity from the, from the government. It's very difficult uh, as we go. We're going through this transition. We know what's uh, happening, but we don't know what's there in the future. And uh, I agree. We have these pilots going on, but it's such a a, a major change. And I'm I'm very aware uh, that. Uh, it's it's very difficult to see how that future is going to go. But John, thanks also for reminding us that at the end of the day, farmers are there for food production. So and uh, and commercial uh, commercially there for in terms of uh, supplying food to us as a nation. And we should never, ever uh, forget that either. So here we have uh, uh, Carl. Thanks very much indeed for putting the graph up uh, in a, what have we got at the uh, the top there? Woodland creation and forestry for advice and assistance and equal number one soil management that, that's interesting so soil is there once again absolutely vital to the health of our uh, land into into the future and third agri environmental schemes uh, indeed um, how to enter those and they can be pretty complicated on occasions and what else the next ones down are business advice and grant funding and regenerative approaches e.g. organics. Oliver will be pleased about that, rewilding agroforestry, uh, which agroforestry is something uh, I've started to in, get interested in, if not a practitioner myself. So thanks uh, for that. That's uh, that's that's great. Thank you for operating the, the, the system, Carl. We, we appreciate that. Now we're going to go into a um, questions and answers. 
I've been keeping a bit of an idea on here, and I thank our panelists who've actually been very active in um, getting our questions answered as we go through to a degree. Still put some in, and we'll all try to come back on them if we don't follow them. But I'm just going to go to one of the earlier ones, which, uh, if I can find it uh, here, um, which is around the the way that Elms looks, uh, sorry, Lagas uh, looks. And Pip, I don't know whether you're, I, I think there's a lot of perhaps not understanding about Lagas, that it's not just one map, there's layers and all that sort of stuff. So um, could you could you just quickly go through and, and tell us what that does? And it's not just a single map with just a couple of colours on, hopefully. <laughs> well, I'll try my best. I mean, I think it's, it's important to say, um, that Lagasse was developed by University of Exeter and we help kind of steer it. It serves lots of different purposes and it is a natural capital hub, as they call it. So there's loads of different layers of information on there that may you might want to just take your time to explore, um, you know, some of which is based on research that the University of Exeter has done. But there it does currently host um, versions of a nature recovery network map here for Cornwall. And there's loads of information within that. So there's map layers on soil carbon. There's layers on la light spill, for example. Um, there's provide wildlife corridors. It's got some of the designated areas within it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it is a prototype. It's a draft. And we're going to be working um, with sort of end users like yourself to hear what you need it to do and bits and bobs about functionality which some people have been putting some really useful comments in the box there um, but also about the data layers and and um, make sure it's fit for purpose basically for all the different purposes because it's got to be used in planning and for elm and you know just for people to find out about their area and such like so we're at the moment, I think we're, we're certainly be learning from some of the things here in the chat box and we'll be pulling that all together and feeding that back to the university so that the next version of it can be even better. But I think what I will say is, you know, we sort of look around at these things in other areas and we should be pretty thankful, actually, because um, I'm quite, you know, Cornwall's doing pretty well to have such a good map, um, the system of maps and such like as we've got there at the moment, but we want to make it even better. <laughs> OK, thanks, Pip. I think that's a good point to make that we're probably well ahead of other parts of the country actually on on that but it's uh, and people can have access to it um yeah, directly it, themselves it's public yeah, isn't it okay it's all, all, all accessible i'm yeah. going to come next to actually a really good question because we've concentrated on aomb areas but uh, peter green's asked a question and i think it's worth going through this again peter are you there do you want to ask it directly about um wh where these uh, schemes apply or not are you there or do you want me to read it out you can come in if you wish can you hear me yeah we can do thanks um yeah it's it's a fairly basic question really it's been really interesting to hear from all the different speakers um and particularly about the trials going on in aonb areas I farm at Stidians um, and we're not in an AOMB. Um, does that mean I'm um, at a disadvantage? You know, do, will the feedback from the trial look to include farms inside and outside AONBs um, equally? OK, who, who would like to, uh, Becky, can I ask you perhaps to come in on that one? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, no, it doesn't mean that you're at a disadvantage at all. Um, depending what scheme you want to go into, there's, there's equal opportunities for everybody. But as I said earlier, the, the sustainable farming initiative is for all land managers um, and the local nature recovery component will be scored. So you will need to hit local nature recovery targets, but it is open to everybody that hits those targets and, and gets a high enough score to get in. Great. Thanks very much. Sorry. Yeah, thank, thanks for that question. I think uh, Charlie Penner also asked a, a similar question there. I'm, I'm next going to uh, looking at these. A really good uh, question, uh, which uh, I focus on as well, from Mark Summers about uh, communication challenges. Mark, are you there? And would you like to ask the question yourself? Are you there, Mark? Okay, I'm 
Mark, I'll read it out anyway. What communication challenges do you think we face with some of the harder to reach landowners and farmers and how might this be uh, addressed? Emma, have you got any of those on, on your patch or what do you reckon? I think it is, um, it's a good question because um, communication, it, it will, we will need to approach it in different ways, I think, in a, in a blended way, really. Some, some people will be easier to contact and others won't be. So we need to, we need to have an approach that um, is inclusive, I think, um, so we can um, speak to farmers from a range of different, um, uh, what they prefer, how they would like to be approached. So that may not be um, on online, for example. So we do we do need to think about a different range of approaches so we can we can welcome as many people to come and talk to us about about ELM. Becky, have you any thoughts on, on that in terms of communication? I see this as absolutely key, I have to admit. And of course, this session is part of it. But. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with Emma. And I think we're in quite a hard time at the moment where we can't get out there. We can't, you know, knock on doors or go and visit farms. Um, and not everybody has internet access or good internet access, particularly in Cornwall. Um, so, yeah, it's looking at a, a different rate way of getting out to everybody, really. So, for example, in my role, I'm, I'm using a, a variety of what's on offer, really. So doing things through the Internet, joining in workshops like these, but also doing one to one on the telephone where, and, and doing small group workshops, which will still miss a lot of people. But it's very difficult at the moment. <laughs> OK. Um, Nick Jarvis, uh, Nick, you've made a, an, I think it's more of a point than a, than a question in a way, but that doesn't matter. Nick, if, if you're there uh, around uh, regenerative farming, would, uh, you're very welcome to come in and make the point to everybody else. Hi, well, sorry, I've been thinking about trees. Um, I can't remember the comment about regenerative uh, farming now, but um, yeah, so um, please either remind me or, or happy to move along. Okay. Right, and you're saying regenerative uh, farming methods are far more profitable than current industrial farming methods. Turnover might be lower per year, but profit for the farmer is higher. I think that's uh, very much something that Oliver's been saying. I don't know whether any of our panellists have a, a view on that from people that they, or from farmers and landowners they know in their, their areas. Okay, I think, well, sorry, yes, come on in. I, I Oliver for that, to be honest. I'd go to Oliver or John or somebody for that response to that. Yeah, that's a good idea. John, John Perry, you st still there? Yes, indeed. Um, just, I'll just, can I just quickly go on the communi communication bit? I think the more farmers get involved, the more farmers get involved, it will start snowballing. As I say, it's important that the government and, and government lead and give us some idea of, you know, profit, well, profit for goal and everything else, you know? It's really, really important because we've got bills to pay, we've got borrowed, borrowed money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We are running a business. This isn't a hobby. This is a business. Most of us are running in Cornwall, and that's got to be remembered. And um, and food's very important. Um, on the other on the other situation, um, I I'm not organic, but I will say that I've got I've got an organic speaker of a farming group next week, so I'm very interested in organic farming and and what it does. And it can be all part of the equation, but I don't believe that uh, a massive percentage of Cornwall will go organic. We are, I'm trying to use less sprays, I'm trying to use less fertiliser, I'm more engaged in my soil. Um, and we're, a lot of people I'm speaking to now, what I call conventional farmers, are looking at that. Because actually, usually when you help the environment, you help your bottom line. That's the brutal truth. And, um, and the more farmers are, are starting to understand that, the better. So we will the, the message will gradually come through. Depending on marketing, what the market wants as well, we've got to be true to the market. At the moment, there isn't much market for organic food, quite frankly. Sustainably dish food, but not organic food. So um, I do know Oliver quite well, and uh, we've met on other situations, but um, I will have to disagree that we, we will have to go organic. But um, there we are. Thanks. Thank you, John. And please come back in on the other ones as, 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 as well as we go, go, go through. Um, we've, we're into our last uh, five minutes here. I'm, I've got lots of questions about Lagos, uh, so you've got a lot of work to, to do there. Um, I've got an uh, interesting question here from James Watty about uh, carbon capture trials. Um, James, are you there? Would you like to ask the question if you're, if you're still with us? 
Hi there. Um, yeah, it was just um, I, I saw the, the reply to that, but yeah, um, so I'm sort of covering a lot of farms on the agronomy side of things. So certainly it is um, it is on people's minds and I think um, certainly down here we are in a fortunate position that we've got a lot of grassland and permanent pasture and um, I think certainly down here there's interest in the potential benefit and the good that that does. Um, that would be very interesting to see the results from that. Okay and uh, James can I just ask I mean you, in, in your work do you feel that there's uh, farmers and landowners are understanding all the changes that are going to happen is it uh, are people aware of it or or what's what's the feeling do you, do you get a feedback in your work yeah um i i think everyone knows there's change coming um a bit like john said it's it's getting the message out there and i think once it's out there it will certainly spread um and i think there is uh, this uh, um sophie said about the sort of um sort of the there's so many unanswered at the moment you look at the the different businesses within Cornwall we've got some of the biggest brassica um, producers in the country rented ground there's a there's an awful lot of questions still to be answered and if there's rented ground people will pay good money for it so yeah there's, there's a lot of uncertainties which which will need answering first Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. That's really interesting. I, I, I don't, has anybody got any um, information on carbon capture trials, um, yeah. Becky? Is that anything that have we been having those in, in Cornwall or Emma um, or P Philippa? Yes, please. One one thing I would say is certainly from the information that we know that um, if you do the right things for nature, then you're drawing down more carbon. So more biodiverse areas draw down more carbon in simplest terms in most habitats. I think the only exception is heathland, you know, because you have to kind of reduce scrub and such like there and trees. But as a general rule, doing the good thing for nature is good for carbon drawdown. OK, um, John, can I just ask you one other one here from Margaret Freegard uh, around um, maximum profit and land management. Margaret, are you, are you with us at the moment? And you'd like to ask that question? Uh, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's just, will there in the future still be large swathes of land managed for maximum profit by farmers who are not interested in engaging with elm? So, uh, interesting question. John, can I? Yeah, OK. Um... As we've highlighted, food production is very, very important in this country. Um, we want to actually produce more for this country, not less. My vision probably is that some land which isn't so productive will perhaps be taken out, be a lot less intensive. Um, but the, what I call the grade one, two land will be more, more potentially more productive, which makes sense, because for the same amount of inputs, you can yield a lot more on grade one, grade two land. So. You know, we, we can't export our environmental problems. We've got to look after it ourselves. We've got to produce food and run with the environment. I think we all understand that, but it's getting the balance right. So, uh, yeah, there will be a lot of food being produced in this country. I've got no doubt about it. And there's a lot of there's a lot of companies and farmers set up that they they are set up to produce food, and that isn't going to change. But they will be looking at the wild and life, looking at the margins. And I'm sure in time, you know, things will be a little bit different, but they need to be encouraged and need to be seen because... It's not just about loss of income, it's income foregone, it's the profit foregone, which is always a problem we have with uh, with the government, is the fact that they just give us what what we wouldn't have made, but they don't give us the profit of, on that land. And I think there is talk about Elms, etc., making, you know, helping us on that front. But as I said, we've all got bills to pay. We, you know, if you've got a talented farmer, I think Peter Green's made the point, which I did make, and he's reiterated it. There's a lot of farmers that got to pay rent, and if they're if, if environmental, um, Management doesn't cover the rent. What do they do? They've got to keep producing the food. So it means discussions with landlords and what have you, and see what the landlords want. So it's a big, big, um, a big, big topic. But I can assure you that it is being talked about now, and um, we are moving forward. Thanks, John. Yeah. I'm going to start wrapping. I just, um, we, I haven't, uh, Sophie. I wondered just whether you'd got any comments from any of the questions, just briefly, that uh, that came up there, and ask Oliver as as well. 
Sophie, Thank that's you. Yes. Yeah, a right. whole host. I mean, I think one thing I would say is that the, the products that we farm on this farm are are not very sympathetic to the to the the, the six priorities in terms of, of, of apart from the, the sheep, um, really. So I think it, it is a big challenge for the brassica growers. Um, um, but having said that, um, growing and eating cabbages is much more carbon friendly than growing and eating beef. So I think there are relativities that we need to think about in this. Um, carbon capture, I did want to touch on. Um, the, I, think, I think carbon is selling, carbon capture is selling at about 19 pounds a tonne, which equates to about 15 to 20 pounds an acre. Um, now that that it that can't compete with with other things that we produce on our land at the moment. Um, so we've got to find a way to better monetize carbon capture, um, and in in order to make it an equivalent or better rewarded. So so I think that there's a number of things. I'll I'll, I'll stop now because I know Oliver wants to probably come in and finish up as well. Yeah, yeah, thank we, you. We pay a lot of more extra money in other areas for for carbon. Oliver, just a, a brief summary or uh, from you on on just thoughts. Yeah, on, I, so I mean, I think loads of interesting points here, and I I I just like to say that I um, uh, organic is not the only answer. There are lots of other ones. I just wanted to make the point about organic, and I, and the the interesting thing about carbon capture, if you look at soil organic matter, and there's a big scheme. Uh, being undertaken by Dutch Ecology at the moment, which is uh, around the country, not just around C Cornwall, looking at soil carbon levels on different types of farms with different types of management practices. So really, really interesting exercise. And we're part of that. And the, the difference between um, uh, the, the national standard for arable is 2% organic matter in soil and that's roughly equivalent also to two percent carbon on okay. our farm our arable is seven and a half percent carbon so you see this massive massive difference um so you know Sophie, as sophie is saying we've got this huge potential for for capturing carbon i'll stop there okay. because i can see the Thanks time that. that's, that's great <laughs> okay let's uh, um, unfortunately we really have run out of time with two minutes so uh, over. Can, look, can I just thank everybody for you've got a really good uh, interaction uh, there and lots of other things which I think uh, I'll make sure our panel comes back to you uh, on. Can I please keep in touch? Uh, this is a continuing story over many years and we, we need to make sure we get it right in Cornwall, not just uh, for the environment but for the for the sector as as well. Together, uh, both need to uh, need to work. So, if I could thank uh, everybody at, uh, at the AOMB, at Natural England, at Cornwall Council, particularly Becca, Becky, Emma, Pip, uh, Melody, Becky, and Carl, and all the people in in the background as well. And thank you, uh, particularly for our speakers as well for for taking us uh, through all this. Now, actually, there is a, a prize draw which. Uh, I'm uh, anticipating and hoping to win myself, um, but uh, uh, I, I don't. I, is it Emma? You're 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 drawing the straws, are you? I am indeed, Robin. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you for everyone for joining and for joining. You were put into a raffle. Um, there's two prizes: a hundred pound Griggs voucher for each of the prize winners. So, drum roll. Heather Elgar is prize winner number one. And Carol Hurst is prize winner number two. Congratulations. And um, we'll be in touch with you to make sure that you get your £100 worth of Griggs vouchers. Thank you very much. Fantastic. I live within a couple of miles of Griggs, so that would have been very useful to me, Emma. So I'm, I'm <laughs> disappointed. But, uh, Sorry, no, Robin. <laughs> Next That's time. Great. Good. Look, thanks, everybody. It's been a great session. I've really enjoyed it. This is such an important area. We're going to stay involved in this and make sure we get lots of input to how it uh, rolls out in, in uh, Cornwall. And please, uh, we have a uh, survey uh, that you can do in the, uh, in the sidebar as well. Please do that. But thanks very much indeed. And uh, good night to you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you.